Our voters, Tony speaking. So they're like, just stop, stop typing, and you'll be fine. Yeah, you're right, and stop driving. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Is my mic on? Shut that off. Ugh. My mic is on. Welcome to AT&T's teleconference service. Please enter your access code, followed by the pound sign. To join the conference as the host, press star. Otherwise, please enter your host password. At the tone, please speak your name. W.R. Cog. There are, one, participants on the call, including you. You are joining your conference as the host. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. I'd like to call to order our meeting for the Western Riverside Council of Governments. And as we start our meeting, I'm going to ask everybody to take a moment of silence, not only for our victims of the Las Vegas shooting, but also for the daughter of our member, Brenda Denstad. Thank you, and I'll ask our Vice Chair if he'll lead us in the pledge. Please join me by placing your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. Thank you. And with that, we are going to try to use our system today for roll call. Does everybody see a login on the screen? No. Now? Now we can. Okay. We have eight. Canyon Lake present? Eastville present? 
Mr. Rush, sir, if you could just press the button on your iPad. Okay, so all we have absent is Canyon Lake. Okay, thank you. And we are welcoming also a new alternate for the city of Moreno Valley, Victoria Baca. Thank you. We'll open for public comments for anything not on the agenda. Do we have any public comment requests? I have no requests. Okay. We next have our consent calendar. Is there anything to be pulled on the calendar? If not, do we have somebody move it? We have City of San Jacinto moved it, seconded by Moreno Valley. Please vote. City of Wildemar, please vote. City of Paris, please vote. District 2, please vote. Morongo, please vote. City of Beaumont, are we having problems? Oh. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, do you not see on the screen? I, I'm not sure what you see. It says approved as recommended. Have, okay, now we have 20 zero. And next we'll have a public hearing on the PACE program. We'll have a staff presentation. programs. Oh, there we go. Uh, the WRCOG PACE program provides financing to residential and commercial property owners for energy efficient water conservation, renewable energy, and seismic improvements. Financing can then be added to the property, tax, property owner's tax bill for repayment. Today we have several actions that we're requesting of the executive committee regarding our PACE programs, as well as an update of some recent legislation. Uh, first, I'd like to provide a, an overview of the activities that are occurring uh, within the WRCOG's PACE programs. Uh, after today's public hearing uh, and accepting the updated program report and accepting Tulare County as an associate member, we'll have 371 jurisdictions participating in our California program. To date, our collective programs have completed nearly 78,000 projects statewide with a total value of over $1.6 billion. The majority of these pro projects have either been HVAC or solar. Uh, of these 78,000 projects, we've resulted in an annual savings in electricity and water of uh, $93 million, created 13,000 jobs statewide with an annual economic impact of $2.8 billion. Um, <clears throat> would like to uh, provide an update now on two pieces of legislation that, were recently, that recently came out of the legislature. Uh, SB 242 by Skinner and AB 1284 by Dababne. Uh, SB 242, which was supported by WRCOG, uh, implements a new series of consumer protections, as you can see on the screen. Uh, these include requirements for confirmed terms calls, same as cash pricing, prohibition on compensating contractors for money above and beyond the cost of a home improvement project, uh, and a pro prohibition on disclosing the amount of funding available for a particular property owner to the contractor prior to them engaging. Um, just wanted to note that while these uh, don't come into effect until January of 2018, uh, WRCOG's program has already implemented uh, all of these new requirements, so it's something to be uh, proud of, of the board. So AB 1284 is the next one. This is, uh, uh, establishes a statewide regulatory framework uh, for PACE providers and contractors. So under this framework, California Department of Business Oversight uh, will be responsible for licensing uh, trainer, or excuse me, providers and contractors. Uh, they'll also be given the authority to levy fines and penalties for those that do not comply with the requirements. Uh, one of the key things uh, in this legislation, it makes several changes to the underwriting criteria to ensure property owners have the ability to pay. 
Uh, and as with some of the 242 requirements, uh, WRCOG's PACE program already has many of these underwriting requ requirements in place. So also something to be proud of. Excuse me. Okay. Our next item deals with uh, adding additional PACE providers. Uh, on June of 2016, the Executive Committee directed staff to reach out to other PACE providers to gain their interest in operating under our PACE umbrella, vet interested providers, and then return to the Executive Committee with recommendations. In March of 2017, California First was brought in to operate, and then in August of this year, staff was directed to enter negotiations with PACE funding, which we will get to uh, here in just a minute. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm here to uh, discuss uh, two companies, Greenworks and Ygreen. So a little bit of background on Greenworks. Um, in June of 2016, the Executive Committee uh, adopted Resolution 14-16, which authorized Renovate America to operate a commercial hero program statewide. Uh, Greenworks was to be the administrator of that program. They were going to be the ones that operated the program. Um, however, we learned in uh, May of this year that uh, they were no longer, Renovate America was no longer moving forward with a commercial hero program statewide. Um, and so we began negotiations with Greenworks to bring them in directly under uh, our umbrella. So a little bit about Greenworks. Uh, been in operation as a company since 2015. However, their founders uh, were the architects behind the state of Connecticut's Green Bank Commercial Pace Program. Uh, Greenworks is a commercial-only pace provider. We've completed 75% of all commercial pace projects nationwide. Uh, and just last week, uh, closed the first commercial-only securitization valued at uh, $75 million. On September 13th, uh, WRCOG's Admin and Finance Committee uh, met and recommended the, that Greenworks be approved under the PACE umbrella. So uh, if there's any no questions from the committee, I'd like to invite Genevieve Sherman up uh, with Greenworks, who can say a couple words. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair and the rest of the committee. Thank you for having me this afternoon. And for those of you that I've been able to present before, thank you for having me again. Um, most of the vital statistics were just covered uh, by Casey, but um, just to repeat, Greenworks is a commercial-only project developer and financier. Um, we started our company about two years ago. We're headquartered in Connecticut um, because our roots go back to the Connecticut PACE program, um, of which I was the director uh, for a couple of years before joining my colleagues to launch Greenworks Lending. Um, to date, we've funded projects in eight states, including the District of Columbia. Um, and as, as was just pointed out, last week we closed on the first commercial-only securitization of these types of assets. That covered projects funded in seven states, received a AA rating by Morningstar. So we are very, very excited um, to enter into California um, with this organization and to bring our um, project development and lending platform into California. But certainly, I am uh, interested in, and happy to answer any questions you have about Greenworks and what we do, what we will be doing, hopefully, in California. Okay. Thank you. We don't have any questions yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Next up, we have Y Green. Uh, y Green operates both commercial and residential AB811 programs uh, up throughout California. Uh, they are being brought forward today to operate underneath WRCOG's umbrella within the subregion. Uh, over the past two months, WRCOG staff has been in the process uh, of vetting Y Green and on August 30th conducted a site visit uh, to their offices in Petaluma. Uh, Subsequent to the site visit, both the PACE Ad Hoc Committee and the Admin and Finance Committee have both recommended approval of Y-Green to operate under WRCOG's PACE umbrella. Uh, I have uh, Mr. Mark Rogers from Y-Green here to answer any questions. Uh, if there are any questions from the board, say a few words. Mark. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much. My name is Mark Rogers, as he stated, Y Green Energy Fund. Feels like being home, being back here at WRCOG. This is where PACE started, and I was uh, very proud to be a part of that. I'm even more proud to be back here today with all of you. 
by Green Energy Fund is a commercial and residential program. We believe in the last year since I've actually joined that team that it has become the best and the most pristine PACE program that there is in the nation today. We're thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Rogers? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, moving right along. So the next one up is PACE funding. So in August 2017, the Executive Committee directed staff to enter into contact negotiations uh, and execute any necessary documents to include PACE funding under WRCOG's PACE umbrella. Uh, as with our other providers, WRCOG would operate as the bond issuer and the oversight authority of the program within the subregion. Since August, PACE funding, WRCOG staff, legal counsel, have worked to update the master indenture agreement, bond documents, program reports, and other related documents to bring in PACE funding uh, under our umbrella. Uh, today, we are requesting that uh, the Executive Committee adopt Resolution 43-17 to authorize the issuance of PACE funding bonds for W, or excuse me, for PACE funding, for, <laughs> for PACE funding. Uh, and then just as a quick note, um, uh, as with all the PACE providers, if a jurisdiction does not want to uh, allow operate, a provider to operate within its jurisdiction, it can opt out uh, through the passage of an opt-out resolution that is provided by WRCOG at their request. Finally, Madam Chair, uh, our final item here today is to conduct a public hearing regarding the inclusion of Tulare County into the California HERO program. Uh, I do want to make a quick note that uh, there was a typographical error in the resolution that was in uh, all of your packets, and I apologize for that. They're inadvertently listed the city of Santa Rosa instead of the county of Tulare. So uh, we have made that change uh, with the chairwoman's uh, resolution and uh, if ex executed it will reflect uh, the county of Tulare and not the city of Santa Rosa. So with that Madam Chair that concludes my presentation. Be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay thank you Casey. Um, if we have any questions then this is a public hearing so we're going to start with uh, questions from the committee first then we'll open it for anyone from the audience. So we'll start with District 1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to compliment uh, expanding our contractors, our funding sources uh, beyond the monopoly that we've had for so many years. Um, I think it's it's good to have competition out there, and so I applaud staff for doing that. Do you and can you offer any comments beyond um, what Mr. Bishop offered uh, in the email about the FBI and Security Exchange? Commission investigation that's underway, and perhaps Riverside County District Attorney as well. Yes, sir. Thank you for the for the uh, kind words, I, and I believe yeah. Mr. Thank Baum you. has a comment regarding your last part. Yeah, we do have a closed session scheduled for today, and okay. we'll update the board on that. Great, thank you. That was it. Okay. Do thank we have you, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, the public hearing then is now open regarding the inclusion of the County of Tulare into the WR Call California HERO program. Do we have any comments? Do we have any callers online for the California HERO program? I hear none. Okay. Since uh, we don't have any, then we'll close the public hearing. Thank you, Casey. And do we have any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, then we have the city of Wildemar moved it, and the city of Lake Elsinore seconded. Please vote. Motion passed, 20-0. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Okay. Next, we are scheduled to have a presentation by Morongo, but Chairman Martin wasn't able to be here today. So we're going to move on to a report from the League of Cities by Aaron Sassy. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today. Um, as you know, the governor has been signing and vetoing bills. Uh, just on Friday, they did sign the housing package. Um, there were several bills in there. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. I know I've been talking about a lot of these bills all year. Um, but a part of the package was SB 540 by Senator Roth. 
That has to do with the workforce housing opportunity zones that lets you do CEQA up front for five years in these designated areas. That was part of the package. Um, we were one of the sponsors of that bill. SB2 was included. This has the $75 fee on real estate transactions. And there's just a couple pieces that I wanted to make sure you're aware of. Um, in this bill, there's a 50% allocation of the funds in the first year to local governments to update planning documents. So it doesn't have to be tied to that specific bill. You can use it to uh, implement SB 540 or specific plans. So just know there's funding available in that first year uh, for your planning departments. Um, so that's definitely something that's good. SB 3 is the Veterans and Affordable Housing Bond Act of 2018. That will be on the November 18th ballot. That was another piece we were supporting. Um, SB 35 was part of the package. This was the one that we did have um, significant concerns with um, that had to do with your arena numbers and being penalized. So unfortunately, that was part of the package. Um, we'll do the best we can moving forward with that. Uh, AB 1250, I know that we talked about that significantly earlier in the year. This was the bill that had to do with contracting, um, both to cities and counties. Cities were removed. The counties remain in the bill. That bill didn't actually make it to the governor, so I suspect it will be coming back next year, but just know for now it is it is dead. Um, AB 890, I know that's another one by Assemblyman Medina that you've all been tracking. Um, that one's awaiting uh, the governor's veto or signature as well. Um, just a little way of background. The, originally, the league was opposed. I know a lot of our cities here were opposed. With the significant amendments that took place, we did remove our opposition. I know some of you still remained opposed, but um, that should be coming out in the next couple of days. Lastly, I just wanted to bring up SB1. I know that we've had several webinars and information available. We do have a toolkit available for all of you on our website. I definitely recommend that you have your staff go there. You do need to submit some of your project lists by October 16th. Um, we did have a bill that we supported with CSAC, AB 135, that was signed by the governor that streamlines the process, gives you some additional timing um, to get your funds if you don't get your project lists in. But do know that you do have to get these lists and you can do a resolution at one of your regularly scheduled council meetings, but you also have to fill out a form that says what your project lists are. So October 16th is coming up quickly. I want to make sure that everybody does get those funds in this first year. So please make sure you're tracking that. Um, all the information is available on our website. It's right on the home page. We have a link just right at the top that you can't miss um, with the, all the information. Uh, with that, uh, we have our golf tournament on Monday. I know many of you are coming out for that. So I look forward to seeing you there. And then November 13th is our next division meeting. The city of Norco is hosting that for us. Um, at that meeting, we do thank all of our sponsors for the year, and we do a division award. So we are seeking nominations for an outstanding public servant award for that. Um, and just hope to have all of you out that, at that. So thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Aaron? Oh, one last thing. I know I've sent this out, but if any of you are interested in serving on one of our statewide league policy committees, I do need to get your name as soon as possible so we can make sure we get everybody on those committees. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Okay. Next, I have Tyler reporting on the regional streetlight program activities. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. And good afternoon, Executive Committee members. Uh, my name is Tyler Masters. I'm a WRCOG Program Manager here, and I'm here to provide you a quick update, uh, seven minutes or less, on the Regional Streetlight uh, Program <laughs> activities. Um, as part of this presentation, I just want to provide you a, a comprehensive uh, update on some of the moving pieces as we've identified in the, <coughs> excuse me, getting over a cold. It's been there for a couple of weeks. Um, on a couple of moving pieces. Uh, the first, the, region, the region's movement towards streetlight ownership from Southern California Edison. Uh, the second, identification and selection of retrofit operations and maintenance service providers. And then the third, uh, the selection, um, the, the, the LED fixture selection support process. <clears throat> So as we've, uh, as a quick point of background, in December of 2014, WRCOG's executive committee directed staff to develop, uh, develop and administer a regional streetlight program for, it, for all interested jurisdictions. Uh, as such, this slide shows a list of the objectives that staff and uh, that, that staff and member jurisdictions have identified as important, and I won't go through them point by point. Um, but promoting cost efficiencies through effective operations and maintenance. 
uh, services and retrofitting lights to low maintenance energy efficient LED fixtures is uh, at the top of the list when, when having communications with you and some of your jurisdictional staff, um, especially when looking at reducing utility bill costs. So uh, 11 jurisdictions within Western Riverside County uh, have decided that it does make sense to move forward with the acquisition of current SCE-owned streetlights within their respective boundaries. Uh, these 11 jurisdictions account for 48,000 streetlights. Um, within the next few months, these 11 cities, these 11 jurisdictions will join the cities of Lancaster, Huntington Beach, Palmdale, Rialto, Rancho Cucamonga, Monterey Park outside of our region in uh, acquiring their streetlights. Um, I'd like to note that predating these decisions, however, I include over two years of jurisdictional analysis, development of cash flows, uh, and financial models, multiple rounds of one-on-one -on -one meetings with a lot of you and your, your uh, city staff, um, as well as regular updates to our WRCOG planning directors, uh, public works directors, city managers, uh, tax. Um, as part of the financial modeling, I'd like to note that we've assumed after debt service, cost of operations, cost of maintenance, LED retrofit costs, the jurisdictions, uh, these 11 jurisdictions combined, will save over $51 million over a 20-year period. Um, and on this slide, there are a few uh, milestones identified in the table, um, starting with the uh, starting the process of the city's uh, uh, council or board approving an action to enter to, to enter into an agreement with Southern California Edison to acquire streetlights within its boundaries. Once executed, the, the agreement will be will be packaged and sent to the CPUC for review and approval. I'd like to note that all of the jurisdictions in the timeline were all kind of moving forward together and expect uh, an approval, review and approval by the end of the year. Um, to help align some of these goals of the regional program and to support the, uh, the upcoming ownership of these additional uh, streetlights, WRCOG released a request for proposal in March to identify the streetlight operations and maintenance services that are out there. Uh, an evaluation committee comprised of representatives from the cities of Lake Elsinore, Murrieta, San Jacinto, Temecula, and WRCOG uh, we assessed seven proposals, conducted two rounds of, of interviews to vet the proposal's retrofit operations and maintenance services, as well as uh, their, customer, their customer service experience. Um, and the Valuation Committee recommended that Siemens uh, perform this work for our, for our subregion. Uh, last month, uh, this board authorized staff to enter into contract and negotiations with Siemens. As such, uh, the contract negotiation uh, uh, amount uh, to a little over 5.9 million over a five-year period. This reflects participation, assumed participation of 55,000 streetlights, which are the 48,000 that your jurisdictions will be acquiring, as well as the, the those streetlights that you you may already own and operate. Um, this scope of work includes the labor and some of the equipment to retrofit the, the streetlights as well as five years of routine operations and maintenance, which includes um, a, a few of those items. It includes proactive night checks on streetlight systems, management of some of those warranties, installation of the, the pole identification tags, administration, and development of, of a web-based and call-in uh, call reporting uh, system. As part of the retrofit phase of work um, is the identification of the, of the right lights for the region. In September, WRCOG released an RFQ to solicit vendors' interest in providing our jurisdictions with LED streetlights. Um, technical specifications listed in the RFQ were extracted from WRCOG's light suite document. Um, approved by this committee last month, the light suite is a guiding document uh, intended to support each jurisdiction's development of outdoor lighting uh, standards. The, this light suite included recommendations and input from Palomar Mountain Observatory, Caltech, American Medical Association, just to name a few, as well as a technical analysis and public input that we drew from the regional demonstration area that we were able to implement in the city of Hemet. And as part of this, we were able to invite uh, 12 outdoor LED manufacturers and over 150 LED fixtures to participate in that analysis. Uh, we then took all of this information and placed it into a request for quotations and expect to have those quotes um, for LED fixtures by the end of October. Uh, once we receive these quotes, uh, WRCOG will set up a working group with jurisdictional staff to narrow the list and, uh, and support identification of fixtures moving forward. 
Um, and that concludes my presentation. We have a requested action. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions? Everybody looks so excited. Um, okay, we have one action. And if everybody's read it on your agenda. Is this the motion, the current one? Okay, we it's been moved by the city of San Jacinto and seconded by the city of Marietta. Please vote. We have 19 yes, no no's, and one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Andrea reporting on the allocation of funding for the Regional Sustainability Demonstration Center Feasibility Study. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the Executive Committee. My name is Andrea Howard. I am a WRCOG Senior Analyst here to present on the proposed feasibility analysis for regional for a regional sustainability center called Experience. Experience is the concept of a sustainability demonstration center and activity hub, which would be the physical manifestation of the goals WR, uh, WR COG six goal areas, health, economic development, education, transportation, water, and the environment. The Envision Center would address regional needs for event and meeting space and provide other attractions to draw audiences from across the region. Once at experience, visitors would be exposed to best practices in such areas as sustainable building and landscaping and healthy design and would be empowered by the center's learning opportunities to integrate such practices into their own homes, businesses, and schools. Um, included in each member's folder is a conceptual brochure with more details on the uh, concept. Um, by way of background, WRCOG first introduced the experience concept to the Administration Finance Committee in August of 2016. Members responded positively to the idea and in allocating the agency's 2015-2016 carryover revenues, identified that some of those funds put into reserves could potentially be used for the experience concept at a later date. Now, recognizing that this concept will require a multitude of partnerships to bring to fruition, staff issued a call for proposals in January of this year and received interest from a variety of parties, including member jurisdictions who are interested in potentially citing experience within their jurisdictions as well as uh, private and nonprofit sector partners. Following interest um, to develop the idea further, in March, uh, staff released a request for proposals for on-call assistance, for on-call planning assistance, uh, which would include a task for um, an experienced feasibility analysis. Uh, three firms um, submitting on this proposal uh, met our minimum qualifications, but the PlaceWorks proposal rose to the, pop, rose to the top of those. Um, and that proposal, which is included um, as an attachment to this item staff report, um, included comprehensive research of relevant model um, to understand both the how and the what. Um, in other words, what kinds of features and programs these sites uh, include and how they're operated. An advisory group to be involved throughout the analysis. Um, demand analysis um, for the center and proposed elements. You know, if we build it, we want to know will they come. Uh, as well as a financial analysis, which would reveal the ratio of estimated costs and revenues. A conceptual site planning and feasibility analysis to look at um, at least three potential sites in the jurisdictions that expressed interest. Uh, those were um, the city of Paris at the Eastern Municipal Water District site, as well as the cities of Temecula and Riverside. Um, and for those, um, Analyses, we would look at do an assessment of the physical and environmental conditions, including the zoning, lot sizes, and historic hazardous materials, uh, site planning concepts for buildings, outdoor uses, circulation, urban uh, uh, design, uh, perform a rough order, or rough order of magnitude for costing, um, perform a SWOT analysis, and um, evaluate the potential governance operations and partnerships. Um, and those elements would all uh, inform the final feasibility recommendation. Today we are looking for the executive committee. Oops. 
Uh, today we're looking for the Executive Committee to support the Administration and Finance Committee's recommendation to authorize and direct the Executive Director to enter into a contract agreement with PlaceWorks to perform the Experience Feasibility Study in an amount not to exceed $249,823. Uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. I would be happy to answer any questions and I'll also note that uh, Karen Gulley, PlaceWorks um, Principal and uh, Experience Concept Proposal Program Manager uh, is in the audience as well if anyone has questions for either of us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from anyone? Saying none. Oh, so we have the City of Calamasa. Mine's not showing anything, but City of Calamasa? Yes, so you're talking about a, qu a quarter of a million dollars for a feasibility study for this, right? Correct. And if it said it was feasible, how much would it cost to, uh, to imp implement this, uh, this program of sustainability and well, feasibility? That's a great question. That's something that the feasibility analysis would help to identify. But what we are looking to do in this process is also to identify the partners that could be coming together to help us to fund it. It's not something that we would then be looking for WRCOG or our member agencies to fund um, in, in whole or any major piece of that. We think that this is really a collaborative effort. And um, we've had a lot of positive uh, responses from the private sector community we think we might be able to uh, lean on as well. What, what specific type of uh, private uh, entities? Uh, we spoke with, um, specifically we spoke uh, in our um, call for proposals process with um, Southern California Edison who expressed interest in partnering. We think that we would also identify several other private sector partners um, in earlier conversations about this concept. Uh, we thought that this might be a great way to also integrate our, our PACE networks and look for those um, PACE funding agencies to also be involved in the process for the contractors who are involved to also potentially be able to showcase their work in this process. Well, I've got a real issue with spending a quarter of a million dollars on something that looks like it's going to cost just a whole lot more. I mean, our feasibility and sustainability seems like we have way too many levels of, um, of the public sector right now trying to partner up with the private. Um, I've got some real issues with this. Understandable. And I would invite our executive director or um, Karen, if you have any comments um, to this as well, um, to go ahead and, and address those if you'd like. No, thank you. Um, so in response to the mayor's comments, um, when we came up with this idea and shared it with the admin committee, I think that there were, there was um, uh, some excitement about pursuing this, but I think everybody has the same questions that you do. And so basically you're looking at taking this one step at a time. So the feasibility study is really based on taking a look at um, in depth detail the three, at least the three sites um, that have been offered up by the three interested jurisdictions. And then we'll be taking a look at, you know, all the market conditions that will um, in the end provide recommendations from PlaceWorks and then for consideration by all of WR College committee structures on whether or not it's feasible to go forward. So one of the primary things that we're interested in is uh, making this, um, if it were to move forward, looking for uh, partners, not just the jurisdictions that may be able to provide the land. Uh, builders may be able to provide some assistance. Um, Andrea mentioned Edison and other potential private sector partners as well. But we do recognize that there's just an awful long ways to go in this. And we're hoping that the feasibility study will give us clarity uh, with regard to um, actually the feasibility of being able to move ahead on any one of these sites. And this is Karen Gully with PlaceWorks. She might want to add to that. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would just add that as part of this process, we are asking to involve many of you as part of the committee, walk through this together, talk about the various sustainable elements that we would be interested in exploring. We are also bringing in um, advisors who are currently running these kinds of centers so that you would have an opportunity to ask them the kinds of questions uh, that you are most inter interested in with respect to how did they get their funding? How much did it cost? What works? What doesn't work? Um, and so that's all part of the process. Right. You're going to be engaged every step of the way. All these buttons don't work over here. Yeah, the buttons don't work down here, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. So okay. You're not so showing on here. Yeah, the buttons don't work over here. Oh, okay. City of Riverside. Yeah, two, two things. One of them, uh, just in, in response to Calamesa, and uh, it's important to tell our story. Uh, to those that don't know about how important sustainability is to us, 
in this region, and we've been, um, you know, awarded um, in many ways in terms of our clean and green uh, programs across the, you know, across the county. And so I think this is a way to tell our story to a wider audience that potentially could return the investment through uh, businesses that want to locate in a place that, that values sustainability in the long run, as well as education. As an educator, it's always important to educate uh, the public about the importance of sustainability. And, and so I support this, but I also wanted to know if uh, the six advisory body, are we looking for the six members today for that advisory body? I would be glad to be a part of that. Maybe you can tell us more about that or if that's uh, for another day that was mentioned in there that there's six, yes, so, six people to step up. Uh, we are looking at the um, number six, I believe, was in reference to the number of meetings that we'll have over oh, the okay, course sorry. of the process. Um, we don't have a hard number on the number of members to that advisory committee, but we will be coming back to the executive committee most likely to identify those. Uh, what we're looking is for uh, both representatives likely of the jurisdictions that we're looking at citing potential um, experience center and those outside of it. So we're making sure that we're rep representative um, of both the interests of um, those specific cities uh, within or who might have um, experience cited there and those outside of the region. We think that this is truly a regional center, although it may be yeah. placed just within one jurisdiction. Good, glad to be a part of that. Good, we have your name yeah. now. Uh, Supervisor Jeffries. Yeah, and I think there's more down here I wanna speak. Um, I stand strongly opposed to this, needless to say, and it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Um, I, I, I'm curious where the revenues come from uh, to fund this, and are they restricted revenues? I can speak to the where they're coming from. So um, in the agency's discussions about the carryover revenues um, in about June or July of 2016, uh, we set aside a uh, significant amount of funds to our uh, agency reserves, and I would ask our uh, CFO to uh, give more exact numbers on that. But at that time, the Administration and Finance Committee identified that some of those could be taken out for uh, this particular concept. We were hitting over the target for our reserves um, at that point in time. And then whether or not they're restricted. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, uh, the funds that we had set aside were from the 1516 net revenues, excuse me, from the PACE program. So we did set aside that amount for this particular program. In addition, set aside some of the amounts for our reserve. Um, is this amount restricted? These amounts aren't restricted, so they could be used for other categories. But when we brought them here, that amount was set aside for this particular project itself. So, Thank you. I, I just, for the members, uh, fellow commissioners, I, I would really express some strong reservations um, with building a monument to ourselves here. I'm not, I'm not sure this is the best way to serve the general public and constituents of Riverside County. I think just about every city in this room is dealing with severe homeless challenges going forward. Uh, we don't have uh, immediate solutions in sight to address the, the chronic homeless and the issues that we face in in many of our neighborhoods. And I think if we wanted to do something that had a meaningful impact on our communities and our residents, we wouldn't look at building a monument. We'd be looking at trying to uh, facilitate homeless shelters, homeless facilities, homeless services from a regional and sub-regional approach and, and not doing something like this. So this, if, if I had to prioritize the, the needs of my constituents, um, this wouldn't make the list. Serving the homeless would make the list. Um, and so I would, I would appeal to my colleagues here to, to look at better uses of funds and, and not, not pursue this. I'm, I'm really surprised this has been in the works for so long, and this is the very first time that the full commission is hearing it. I mean, it's kind of it's surprising it went as far as it did without ever daylighting to this commission. And it, you, you put yourself on a path where it makes it really difficult to reverse course and say, you know, we got a better use of funds. But again, it's just, just my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor, just for you, just uh, as a reminder, we have granted money towards the homeless programs in various cities. So that is one of the uh, items that we are uh, addressing also. We now have the city of Murrieta and then followed by Murrieta is Supervisor Washington. Um. 
I do support this. Uh, number one, uh, you, you know, one of the great uh, opportunities that we've had in Riverside County is uh, we were given a, a pretty big patch of green space out here uh, for which to build on. And one of our goals for the past 20 some odd years, 30 years, whatever it has been, is not to make the same mistakes that other communities, other counties, other cities uh, have made in their planning and how they go about planning out their communities. We don't have to be, you know, the extremist environmentalists to get behind programs that help us leave a little bit better footprint or make better use of the resources that we do have available to us in Riverside County. This is one of those type of uh, opportunities that we have to show people how that can be done. And that's why Riverside County is one of the counties that is recognized as um, and, you know, I, and I'm with you as far as, you know, we don't want to overdo it, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to go back to the days where, you know, we had smog in our lungs if we uh, hung out in the front yard too long. And I remember them well, and I couldn't even see the hills, and I lived five miles away from the hills. So, you know, these are efforts to try to continually address those. And the only way we're going to be able to explore which efforts work and which ones don't is, yeah, you're going to have to have studies once in a while, and these studies are not cheap. What's more expensive is not addressing the issue at all and taking a shot at something without a study and wasting millions of dollars on something that turns into a boondoggle. We are addressing the homeless issue. I believe it was a million dollars. Is that how much we were contemplating putting into that? And you know what, you can throw $5 million at the homeless issue and we still won't have the solutions to that. And there will be studies about how to go about helping the homeless. Those studies are going to cost money too. So, you know, this is, to me, it's all about trying to address the myriad of issues that we have in a responsible way. And this is one of those issues. You know, how do we sustain what we're doing out here, how do we attract jobs, how do we get employment here so people are not driving three hours a day to LA and to San Diego to work. And uh, centers like this can help, just like they were talking about, can help employers learn that this is a good area for their people not only to live, to work, and to stay, but not to have to drive all over the place. So we are helping everybody by using this forum and the profits are the, the net money generated from the PACE program to look at these things. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking at them at all. So I, I do support this. I, you know, and I don't like spending a quarter of a million dollars on a study, but at the same time, I don't like not having answers. I don't like not having opportunities. And uh, that's what this gives us. So, you know, that, that being said, uh, I, I'm fully supporting uh, this so that we can get the answers we need to be responsible about what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think Council Member Sayardo covered most of it pretty well. Um, um, I just want to underscore um, the funds are coming from the PACE program. Correct. And, and the PACE program is essentially about um, being more sustainable. Um, people use the money through the PACE program to make solar improvements, to put, put in new HVAC systems, save energy, right? So it seems like if the, the PACE program is generating enough excess funds that we could allocate some funds towards promoting the program that generated the funds and, and sustainability, that that's an appropriate use. I, I, I got the sense from some of the comments that people were thinking is, this is coming out of their dues or something. And um, I, I just I thought maybe we need to clear up that, that point, that these are funds that are generated by the PACE program and that we 
last year set aside and designated for this effort. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And we did not at that point um, designate any specific amount of funds or earmark anything, but we did set aside an excess amount into reserves above our initial target uh, with the idea that it could go towards this aim. Okay. Um, and consider that exact point that you made, that this is along the same lines of the sustainability practices that are generating these funds, that those revenues would go back into it. But beyond that, it's, it's also um, supporting health. It's also supporting economic development. Um, to Supervisor Jeffrey's point, I, I certainly understand and appreciate your concern, sir. Um, but I would um, just point out that the, the intent of this is certainly not to be a monument in any way, shape, or form. Um, but um, I think that it does, as uh, Mayor Bailey and Councilmember Ciarto pointed out, uh, does help to generate that idea that this is a, uh, a different region than a lot of people envision it to be today and to help that um, the goals that we have to bring in more um, economic development and attract different kinds of firms. Um, and ultimately, you know, with a multi-pronged effort, uh, address the concerns for uh, real human crises like homelessness. Okay, thank you. Next we'll have, uh, City of Narco, did, were you, yes, because your name went up and then went down, so, City of Narco? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think this is slipping brilliant, unless you look at it through the eyes of a 40-year-old. This, exactly, this is exactly what millennials want. They don't put money in, they, they, they want to do things, they want to feel they're contributing. Um, I just left a whole seminar last week at UCLA about millennials, and um, we're, we're old. And the truth of the matter is, I, I mean that with all due respect, but the reality is they want to participate. They want to have places like this where they feel they're making a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I get the quarter million dollars, I get all that stuff. But the reality is our service groups are dying. You're packing your cities with houses. They're going to hate our guts in 20 years. They're going to go, what the hell were you people thinking? And they're going to want to have healthy places to live. And they want to be involved. And this is a place where you can attract 20, I have one, 26 years old. You're going to attract them. They're going to say, wow, I can be part of an outdoor classroom. I can be part of an interactive demo. I can teach kids. I can do this. I can do that. They will be part of the system. And that is what millennials want. We can't look at all of our constituents through our eyes. I'm 62 years old. I have no idea what a 24-year-old is thinking. I have no idea what my daughter's thinking. <laughs> but I do know she has a very powerful job, and she is surrounded by 20-year-olds. And this would be something that I will bet you any amount of money she would, get, she would get involved in. And I think that through these kinds of things, we begin to feed them into our service groups. We begin to feed them into our various things that our communities needs. Homeless shelters, Kiwanis, Rotary, they're dying. And I think this is, this is a brilliant move and I 100% support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Jeffries, you're back up again. Is, were you done? Yeah, it's just not showing down here. And I just want to point out that I did ask early on if these were restricted funds. They are not. So they were not earmarked for PACE programs, according to everybody who explained they're not restricted funds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, they came from... Okay, we're going to agree to disagree on that point right now. And we'll have the city they of They are restricted funds. Somebody needs to say so. You said they are not restricted, correct? Yeah, these uh, funds coming from PACE, they're, they're not restricted in the sense that they're not TUM funds, so they can be used as designated. Right. So if we wanted to use them for help fund homeless shelters, we could. If we wanted to use them for economic growth attraction, we could. I mean, we could use them for pretty much however we as a commission wanted to do. It's just it took a year to get to this commission about what these plans were, and there was no input from the commission prior to this. Okay, thank you. City of Cala Mesa? Yeah, as for uh, clean air, I don't think this does anything for clean air. In fact, I think we've got several government agencies that deal with every atom of clean air right now. Also, if uh, 
Mayor Bailey wants to attract businesses here, it might help if we could actually have homes that the workers that are going to work in those um, businesses can afford. I don't think a $70 fee transaction coming out of Sacramento is going to do anything for any more affordable houses. You know, we're talking about doing a study of things that we should be having this conversation right now. That's what that's what we're elected for. You know, this is the this is one of the first times where I, I want to get Kevin's ire up over there. I, I, I want to see Rusty's ire up. I don't want to always have to listen to the crazy guy next to him either. I'm not talking about you, Marion. This is the kind of thing that we don't need to do this. Let's, let's make these decisions ourselves. We've got plenty of experience, and we can have some of the experts come in there and tell us exactly what it is. But I'll tell you what, this area needs homes. We all know that. And there's going to be more and more homeless people if we don't bring business to California and make it more affordable. That's what I'm saying. Okay, thank you. City of Corona? Thank you. Um, I don't necessarily disagree that we could study this. Um, I do think 250 grand to do it is a lot of money to do it. But I also think, um, as I had mentioned at the admin committee, I think we have three cities that have volunteered, and I know it was mentioned that we would look at uh, trying to do one of my suggestions with, if we're going to move forward with this and we're going to end up with one location, that it would make sense to try to put it someplace as central as possible within the western region. So nothing against Temecula, but that's not necessarily central. And so I think that's a, a big part of what we need to look at. And again, to Supervisor Jeffrey's point, if the, if the rest of the uh, board has not been as familiar with this project, um, maybe their cities have not even looked at trying to be a part of one of the sites as well. So I just want to make sure that if we do move forward with this, that we are seriously looking at, you know, making this available to the entire area because it won't help to build a facility that our schools, if we have school kids that want to go to it, that they won't be able to afford the bus transportation to get there because it's, you know, an hour away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. City of Riverside? Sorry to chime in again, but I, I had to uh, reference the Julius Caesar quote, experience as a teacher of all things, and to look, we have a superintendent of county schools here, and not to put her on the spot, but, you know, what do you think about uh, this, this opportunity, um, uh, the experience uh, that, you, that you've heard and you've seen today? Thank you for the opportunity to respond. One of the things we have to do in education is to know where we want the students to be. We can't look at it in the present. And from the research that I've experienced, this is the type of venue that's needed for true collaboration and opportunity. By even creating a venue of this nature, you uh, motivate a certain type of thought. And it's something that I would support it is also something that I would commit to in terms of the educational part. Uh, and so when we talk about commitment, we're talking about resources, we're talking about our, our sphere of influence. And I also am very concerned about homeless and other areas, but this is part, part of a solution. So this is what I, when I read it, I saw it as this is where you would find a place where different stakeholders can come together under a neutral roof and come up with solutions for our community. I know this is a part of your ethos in terms of your vision for a teacher's village, yes. which is a sustainability model um, that puts education educators into their community and uh, supports sustainability that way. And so I just wanted to, yes. to make sure that our resident teacher here on the dais had, had an input. And, and just thinking about the synergies with CARB, California Air Resources Board that's coming to Riverside and connected to UCR and CSERT for all those uh, for all that, that synergy, it's exciting uh, to, to have this, this concept come up at this, at this time. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, I do have a question in regards to the feasibility study. Whether we move forward or not, as we gain information, this will be information we can use in other avenues and other venues in addition to looking at a place. 
but that will provide us with information as we move forward as uh, Council of Governments. Certainly. I would expect that uh, uh, quite a bit of the information that we uh, find in this process could be something that's applicable elsewhere. Um, from my understanding, the Eastern Municipal Water District, and perhaps Director Slauson would like to speak to this point as well, is looking to move forward with um, some elements of experience regardless of this process. And so I think we can look forward to, at the very least, um, some pieces of this being um, supportive of, of their ultimate uh, development there in Paris. Okay, thank you. We have the city of Temecula, and then we'll ask yeah. if Mr. Slauson would have comments after that. Just just a real quick shout out to Mayor Bailey and the quote of Julius Caesar. Okay, that's it's a, it's a first year. I like it. I like it. And uh, to my good colleague down on the other end of the dais, Eugene, listen, you can come to Temecula. You can use the facility. Trust me, you'll enjoy it if it's located in Temecula, okay? Um, but that's, that's all I have to say, Madam Chair. <laughs> I just wanted to be clear, Quran is not central either. <laughs> okay. okay. Eastern Water, did you have any comments? Uh, yes, I, I do support it. We, have a, we do have a similar type of project going, and ours was a little uh, less expensive. However, this may be a little more uh, expansive, and I, I think uh, Dr. White's comments uh, are very poignant and to the uh, and correct. I, you know, when discussing the homelessness and other issues, you can't. I don't think you can really just say, well, it's it's not for homeless, so we can't support it, because in order to have a nice, viable community, a pro, you know, attacking it with multi prongs, I think is the appropriate method. And this is, I think, this is a positive. Uh, addition. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions? It, yeah. it's, Supervisor been Washington. it's been brought to my attention that there might be a willing partner in one of the water districts that could share the cost <laughs> for the feasibility study. I'm, ju I'm just... <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm sure that uh, we will be looking for partners to help us with the feasibility study in many different avenues, correct? The, the bottom line. Yes. Okay. Do we have any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we do have a requested action, which is to fund the feasibility study in an amount not to exceed $249,823. It's been moved by District 5, seconded by City of Moreno Valley. Please vote. Motion passed 17 to 2 with one abstention. And I want to thank everyone, too, on this item. This was a good discussion. So, we, you know, it, we're not here to just rubber stamp everything, but to discuss it. And I think this was a good discussion, and I know you'll bring us back some more information. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have a TUM program activities update from Chris. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairwoman, members of the committee, Chris Gray, Director of Transportation for WRCOG. I have a, um, for me, very brief item. Um, <laughs> first of all, we have um, two reimbursements we're bringing to you. One is for um, planning work in the city of Lake Elsinore in the amount of $2.6 million. Uh, secondly is a project, the Adams Street Interchange in the city of Riverside. This is for planning and engineering phases. It's the amount of $4 million. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we are now in the process of moving our um, various TUF documents through our cities. Uh, here was the fee schedule approved by the Executive Committee. Uh, to give everyone an update, um, we have now completed uh, public hearings on the TUF ordinance at all of our member jurisdictions except for the City of Riverside, which is tomorrow, uh, the City of Murrieta, which will be in about a week, uh, March JPA, and the County of Riverside. Um, so, so far the ordinance has passed with all of our cities. Uh, and we're also meeting with each city individually to discuss the status of their town projects. So if you um, have questions on a project um, and would like to join us for those meetings, you are welcome to join us. Uh, they're very thrilling. Um, 
but it is it is important to understand because uh, we are talking about um, major projects within your city, uh, and those meetings have all gone well. Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know that this is um, a recent effort we did to actually go through and inventory all of our credit agreements. As many of you are aware, you're allowed to build a TUMF facility through an in lieu credit agreement. This then generates credits which offset your TUMF obligation. Um, we always knew that this was a significant part of building the TUMF system. We didn't know exactly how much. Uh, we determined so far that um, we have received about $136 million in TUMF funding. It's been offset through in these in lieu agreements. Um, and then we've uh, reimbursed an additional $23 million to developers where they built above and beyond their TUMF obligation. Uh, this is important because the total TUMF collections have been about $700 million. So this indicates about 15 to 20 percent of projects are meeting their TUMF through the credit agreements, meaning that they continue to be an important uh, mechanism for our program. Um, we've noticed a couple of, of I call fairly modest items, but we determined that the, uh, many of the credit agreements, particularly ones that entered into the beginning of the program, had no termination clause, meaning they remained in effect. Um, and normally we wouldn't care about this, but we've had a couple of instances where some very old credit agreements, um, the project has been brought forward. Uh, this might have been a project that initially was entitled in the early 2000s and it changed hands six or seven times. Uh, the project was brought forward and they started paying TUMF and then someone realized they had a credit agreement that forced us to then uh, refund them for fees paid. Um, so we are going to be doing a couple of minor changes to the credit agreement, allowing the cities to terminate them, and also um, giving the city the option if uh, the credit agreement's entered into and no work is done within a set period of time, so just 10 years, the uh, agreement's automatically terminated. Uh, we'll be bringing those uh, recommendations first to our public works directors and then to our various committees. Um, I also just want to remind everyone that we are in the process of updating our TUMF calculation handbook. We are um, digging through some issues like how to calculate TUMF for gas stations. Um, and we have also determined that we believe there is some evidence to support a uh, update, uh, a new, sorry, a new fee calculation process for these Amazon distribution slash fulfillment centers. The reason being is we have some preliminary information which suggests their traffic impacts as compared to typical industrial spaces are substantially higher. Therefore, it warrants a uh, separate fee calculation. However, we don't have enough data to definitively determine what that calculation should be, so we'll be kicking a study off uh, within the next month. I also wanted to let everyone know that we'll be bringing forward a formal reimbursement manual, um, which guides your jurisdictions, and it should expedite uh, reimbursement for as your agency builds TUMP facilities, you get reimbursed. Um, so, Madam Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions. I did want to say we have two requested actions, which is authorization to execute a reimbursement agreement with the City of Lake Elsinore for about $2.6 million and an authorization to execute a reimbursement agreement for $4.1 million. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Seeing none, it's been moved by the City of Murrieta, seconded by the City of San Jacinto. Please vote. And Madam Chair, the water districts don't vote on TUMF items. Okay. Motion passed 17-0. Next, we'll have a report from our Technical Advisory Committee Chair, and I'd like to introduce our Interim City Manager from the City of Manning, Alex Diaz. Madam Chair, Executive Committee, uh, pleasure to be here today for my first executive meeting. Uh, no items to report today. Uh, our meeting was canceled for last month. We are scheduled for uh, October 19th at 9.30, and we will have a report for, for uh, the executive committee at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. A report from our committee representatives. Does anyone from SCAG have any reports? I will add, I know we have an economic summit coming up, but I forgot what the date is. And we don't have Arnold here today. Andrea can help us out. Okay, so if you want to put that down. And November 9th, there will be an economic summit put on by SCAG. Yeah, say it again. Yes. Do you know the location by any chance? We'll try to get the information out to everyone via email. It's the... Well, I get the specific, but Hotel 
Figueroa Street. What's the hotel? Do you have it? Andrew? Yeah, is it the Regency? Los Angeles LA. Hotel. We'll, we'll make sure we get the LA Downtown Hotel. hotel. Yeah. We'll send out our agenda review later this week, too, to everyone. Okay, thank you. And then we have a regular SCAG meeting this week, right, on the 5th? Yes. Yeah. We have a regular meeting. And uh, do we have anything from AQMD? Uh, just that uh, Dr. William Burke, who's our chair of the board right now, uh, was reappointed by the uh, assembly uh, uh, member that appoints him. And uh, that's his, will make up for 28 years once he gets through this term. So he's been there for a little while. He's been the chair for 18 years there. So a lot of history and uh, has continued to serve on that board for quite some time. Okay, great. Thank you. Do we have anything from CalCog? No, Madam Chair. Our next meeting is November 27th. Okay, thank you. And now from our executive director. Thank you. Just one item to report, and it's just a reminder that we do have an agency visioning workshop that's scheduled for October 12th uh, at uh, the Western Municipal Water District. Uh, invites to all of the executive committee members, alternates, uh, and all of our um, standing and non-standing committees, so finance directors, planning directors, technical advisory committee, public works directors are also invited to attend. Our facilitator for the uh, morning session, this will be over 12 o'clock, is Bill Higgins. Bill, if you don't know him, he's the executive director for CalCog. Uh, he brings a lot of experience, and we're hoping that, um, as was suggested by Member Montanez last month, Bill will talk about some of the things that other councils of governments throughout the state are doing. So uh, it's going to be a good opportunity for us to take a look at the accomplishments that we've been able to uh, uh, accomplish in the, in the course of the past few years since our last visiting session and hopefully uh, get your ideas on uh, what kind of activities you see as having uh, some regional benefit and per perhaps participation from WRCOG as well as things that you think that uh, are important perhaps regionally but that the agency should not be involved in. So make, make sure that you be there and I think you'll find it very helpful. Thank you. And next we have we'll items for future agendas. Does anyone have anything? Seeing none, we'd like to welcome Brenda. And we sympathize with you and your loss. Thank you for joining us today. And then um, any general announcements? Brenda. Madam Chair, I just wanted to um, say thank you so much on behalf of my family and myself for the uh, tremendous outpouring we felt on the tragic loss of my daughter, Leanne. It's truly been a very um, humbling experience, and I just want to thank you all so much for your well wishes, your prayers, the phone calls, the emails. I just I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll keep you and your family in prayer. Next, we'll turn it over to our uh, attorney. For closed session? Yeah, if we do have a closed session. We'll ask for the uh, board members to come down to the um, audience, please. So we want to thank everyone else for your attendance, and we will only be able to have board members here for the closed session.